Eleanor Williams's claims that she'd been trafficked by an Asian grooming gang led to protests, racist attacks, and claims of a cover-up. Eventually, she was jailed for lying. I don't want to be that girl that cries rape. I'm not that person. I'm Sky News's Jason Farrell, and in Unreliable Witness, we ask, why did she lie? And explore unanswered questions with new revelations. Follow Unreliable Witness wherever you get your podcasts. A place that's racked by conflict that's already killed tens of thousands and is in the midst of a humanitarian catastrophe that sees children die every day. Aid is desperately needed, but precious little is getting through. I'm Neil Patterson, and in this edition of the Sky News Daily, no, we're not talking about Gaza, instead Yemen. After almost a decade of civil war between the Saudi and Western-backed Yemeni government in the south and the Iranian-backed Houthi militia in the north, the country is not so much on its knees as it is face down in the dirt. Yet, the international outrage has been striking by its absence, certainly when compared to the plight of the Palestinians. Indeed, in response to Israel's war on Hamas, the Houthis have increased their attacks on cargo ships passing through the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden, bumping up prices everywhere, including Yemen. You can also throw into the pot, alongside war and famine, significant water shortages, a cholera outbreak which threatens to become an epidemic, and a pending ecological disaster. Simply put, why are precious few of us seemingly paying any attention? Suffering doesn't hide itself in Yemen, and hunger hits the young most hard. Salah's too weak to drink anything. Our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, has travelled back to a country she visited just a few years before, and she joins us now alongside her producer, himself born and raised in Yemen, Ahmed Baider. Uh, Good to see both of you. Alex, let's start with you. Just tell us exactly what have you and the team been seeing? Well, you know, Neil, how difficult it is to really get over misery and suffering. It is monumentally hard, but everywhere you look in Yemen, it seems that there are people suffering. And it's not a small amount of suffering, it's, it's suffering on a massive scale. It's acute hunger. It's absolutely severely malnourished, skinny beyond imagination babies who are struggling to breathe, struggling to cling on to life on an hourly, minute by minute basis. So it is absolutely unrelenting. Am I surprised? I wasn't surprised so much as still shocked at how the level of misery and how much it's still going on. I'm going into hospitals where, you know, I'd see a small group of uh, very malnourished babies or I'd have to go further deep into rural Yemen to find those really uh, critical states of, of people, you know, whole villages. And now, you know, within, within a couple of minutes of going into the hospital in Aden, we, we saw two really, really badly ill babies, you know, four-month-old, five-month-old babies who, who are suffering. So the, the evidence of the suffering seems to be much more in your face. It is a clearly a dire situation. I mean, Yemen is not a country without natural resources. So one has to wonder whether all of these problems that we are seeing are simply a result of the almost a decade of conflict or, or during that period of conflict, whether there has been mismanagement by the government in the south and those in the north as well. You've absolutely nailed it there, Neil, because corruption plays an enormous part in uh, the disruption in this country. There is absolutely no doubt about it. War has had a horribly degrading effect on all the civilians, on all the Yemenis, because the country is a patchwork of armed checkpoints held by different groups, sometimes just by criminals, as well as by the Houthi militants in the north and the internationally recognised government uh, who, who run the south. Sometimes, as an outsider, you can get the impression it's corruption that's succeeding here. That's the only thing that's thriving in Yemen. However, it is hard for a country to succeed when it is immersed in war, because even just getting into the country as a foreign journalist, you don't just get in simply by applying for a visa. You have to be cleared and get permissions from a whole range of different bodies and pseudo authorities and others that are labeled designated terrorist organizations in some parts of the world to actually get access to the country. And even if 
when you do get access to the country, you need more permissions to get through every single armed checkpoint. Can you imagine how difficult it is to run a country, for a country to trade, to travel, to move around for its citizens, for it to thrive? Despite the complete economic collapse that the country has experienced, despite the humanitarian problems that the country is very, very clearly experiencing, I mean, the Houthis, they seem to be in pretty good spirits as they flex their muscles in both the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. The Houthis have long been backed up by one of the two big regional powers here, Iran. And when they started to get very powerful, take over huge parts of the country, including the capital, Sana'a, then another regional power stepped in, and that was Saudi Arabia. They put together a coalition which was supported by the US, the UK, and the United Arab Emirates, and they have propped up an internationally recognized government ever since for the past nine years. Both sides have been accused of committing a raft of human rights abuses and committing war crimes. And both are being investigated by various international bodies for those war crimes. It has led to utter misery for millions of Yemenis. Um, but right now, the Houthis have thrust themselves once again into the spotlight. And now Yemen is on the, the map as a result of, of what's going in, on in Gaza because the Houthis, uh, the Iranian-backed group, uh, they say they don't receive quite so much backing from Iran as, as the West makes out, but they, they certainly have had some support over the years. The Houthis are, have maneuvered themselves into a position where a lot of the world and the politicians are now talking about their involvement in what's happening in Gaza. Just on that point, I mean, you, you've been speaking to those in the inner circle, those, you know, very close to the high command uh, of the Houthi organisation. And, and and you can understand, I can, I can from, from a remove, understand regional sympathies for the Palestinian plight. But but this, I, it, it, is, it strikes me as about far, far more than a, than a show of support uh, for the Palestinian cause. Tell me a little bit about the conversations you've been having with the leadership. The inner circle is a very tight one. I mean, no one really um, ord ordinarily, and certainly not Western journalists, gets to talk to the actual leader. But we got pretty close talking to one of his cousins, uh, Muhammad al Houthi, who's a, a senior leader and, and definitely part of that, that inner circle. And certainly the, their critics say that they have used the whole Gaza uh, war and the Israeli bombardment of, of the Palestinians in Gaza in an opportunistic manner because they have always attacked certain shipping um, cargo ships that have been making their way through their very critical stretch of water, the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden and the Bab al-Mandeb Strait, which takes uh, something like 12%, 15% of world trade. They've always attacked ships there. But now the difference is they've linked it to what's happening in Gaza. And that has propelled them onto front pages and wreaked havoc on international trade. That has sent prices of everything, everywhere, including in your homes, wherever you may, might be in Britain or America. But obviously, it's going to hit those who don't have any money in normal times. And that includes the Yemenis. So the Houthis are using this opportunity to really hammer home what they see as the Western hypocrisy. They've said this war has gone on for nine years. Britain and America and everyone else never cared enough to sort out the problem here in Yemen. Why are they now focusing on the Houthis who are taking a role, this is the Houthi argument, in defending the children and women of, of Gaza. He spent a lot of time hammering home that point. They're very, very loyal towards the Palestinian cause. Absolutely, absolutely. And we feel that we share the same suffering. I mean, I was telling Alex as well that in primary school, we used to support Gaza. I remember that we kept, you know, Gaza was uh, has been always the case for Yemenis. Uh, even though we would suffer from different wars, from economic situation, but in the same time, we really feel people suffering because we, we know, we know how it's difficult for women and children to, to survive in war zones. So, 
Gaza or Palestine it has been a major case for not just for Yemen but for all Arabs. I mean, I remember uh, I will quote a fisherman that we met just yesterday that said, like, we are Arabs, we, we, are, we support Gaza because we are Arabs and we share the same blood. The thing is, though, Neil, is you very adeptly put your finger on, mm. the Houthis haven't always been popular and they, they weren't popular before October the 7th in many parts of Yemen. They were feared because of the power that they exerted, because of the hard line they took on, on many issues, women's rights, journalist rights, uh, human rights. Uh, now, those accusations you can level against the, the administration in the South as well. There's no doubt about that. But the Houthis taking part in this and attacking international trade has seen a massive spark, spike in their popularity. Let's pause there for just a moment, uh, but when we return, we'll be taking a long, hard look at what Yemen's future might look like with or without any more international assistance. Back in a sec. Welcome back. We are continuing to talk Yemen with our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, and her producer, Ahmed Bayer, himself from Yemen. Guys, is there any sense where you are that given the economic problems the country's facing, the massive problems with food and famine, uh, the issues with the lack of water, the waterborne diseases you've mentioned, is there, is there any sense that any of this will shift the dial in terms of public opinion inside Yemen? Because clearly it is doing nothing significant for, for global public opinion. That is a really tough one to answer. I think right now, certainly based on our talks with the, the Houthi inner circle, is that they think all of this is our sacrifices worth paying. Even the fishermen that we, we were with on, 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 on their boat for several hours and who had spent most of that time telling us how they couldn't afford anything, they, even their big haul of fish wasn't enough to even cover their expenses, they were only going to make the equivalent of one dollar a day. Even they said, but Gaza, that's worth doing. And we, we you know, as, as Muslims, they feel like they can't do anything else. So the Houthis are definitely uh, on the side of public opinion here in Yemen. On, and they, these people are on, on different divides, of different sides of the civil war. So that, that, is, that is really important for politicians and those who are trying to unravel this really complex and difficult situation in Yemen. There should be inclusive peace process that can qualify uh, political parties to come back to the negotiation table. And when there is a peace deal, as I said, it's very, very good that we can do really good peace deals. But when it comes to implementation, it's, it's not tangible by the civilians. We in Yemen as civilians, if you go in the north or south, we lose trust. We lose trust of our political parties and we lose trust of, of the international community and the peace deals. Yemeni people now, they are now in a position that they need to see tangible, you know, implementation, improvements, improvements in, in the situation, either in the economy, either in their daily life or a, a, any, anything that can give hope. Because, you know, when you lose hope, when a nation loses hope, it's a very big deal. I suppose then, this is a personal reflection, that, that I'm, I'm not entirely certain which is the most affecting part of the, of the reporting that, that you guys have done so far. Those images, which I have dwelt on, of the children, the babies in the hospital, emaciated beyond belief, not just being able to count the ribs, but seeing the outline, seeing the circumference of the ribs, such as the, 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 the amount of hunger that these children are experiencing. Of course, that, that, is, that is an image that will stay with me. And, it, and of course, it makes me flash back to, you know, what was going on in Africa in the 1980s and, and, and obviously makes me reflect on the lack of a response that we had back then. But, but more, than the, more than the starving children, if you can, if you can imagine me using such a, such a phrase, is the, is the pending ecological disaster that is, that is waiting off the coasts of Yemen right now. Tell me a little bit about what is happening in the seas. And again, this is as a direct result of what the Houthis are up to. So the Houthi attacks uh, have not only uh, disrupted international trade, which has, has had an impact everywhere on the, on the rise in, in costs, a rise in prices, but they attacked a cargo ship which was carrying 22,000 tonnes of very hazardous chemical fertiliser. It's called the Ruby Mar. They hit it in mid-February. Almost straight away, they saw 
uh, satellite pictures and images saw an oil slick, they'd hit the engine room. But that is nothing compared to the potential catastrophe which the Yemeni scientists are fearing. If the containers of this hazardous chemical fertilizer break and just disseminate into the Red Sea. Yemen is a country which is on its knees economically. It does not have sophisticated equipment. It does not have um, equipment or machinery like submarines which can go down, inspect the hold, look at the containers, either mend it or find out some way of extracting those uh, hazardous chemicals. So the Yemenis feel like they are sitting on an environmental catastrophe which is just waiting to happen and it will have a devastating impact on the Red Sea, coral reefs, mangroves, turtle nesting sites, desalination projects. They feel they're looking in the face of some sort of environmental Armageddon, which they cannot handle themselves. On top of that, the, the government in the South does have responsibilities, doesn't it, when it comes to not just the, the cleaning up of the water off its coast, but the policing of them. And I suspect on that topic as well, they are incapable of doing that job. The Ruby Mar uh, ship is not just only Yemen responsibility, but I believe it's for the world responsibility as well, because if it happened, it will do a very massive impact on the, the sea marine and, you know, the region itself. And just so you know we had really good access with Alex talking to the Yemeni Navy and we saw their capacity the capabilities are very weak they're having to test the water samples with no solutions no proper samples only 17 samples antiquated equipment I mean it really is like you know going along in the dark um, they, they're just not able to deal with coping with all the, all the challenges in their own country, never mind an impending environmental catastrophe. The thing that has always puzzled me on this topic, Yemen, the poorest country in the world, infrastructure completely collapsed. The United States, the United Kingdom, Saudi Arabia, all incredibly rich, all incredibly capable militarily. Why on earth have they been unable to deal with the Houthis? They've all got to be found a, a, a way forward. Now, let's remember that just a year ago, Iran and Saudi Arabia had basically agreed to join together and try and sort out this proxy war and using Yemen as, as a battlefield between the two of them. That they drew up a kind of roadmap to peace, but that has faltered because it's been knocked off course by the events which have happened in the Middle East and in the, in the region since October the 7th. Why has there been this lack of interest in a decade-long civil war, why hasn't Yemen been so visible, do you think? As members of the human race, we probably like to think that, um, that, that maybe they just haven't cared because their attention's been somewhere else. But there are definitely a body of opinion and critics who would think that they have cared. They just haven't cared about killing civilians and civilian suffering. Both sides have used it to their advantage to suck the life out of Yemen in terms of uh, using Yemen's resources and using Yemen as uh, a way of achieving their own objectives. There's a new generation of younger people who are hammering on the door and demanding to be heard to try and put places like Yemen back on, on the map. But it, most ordinary people, aid agencies, and ordinary civilians would say it's a shocking international disgrace that a country can be left to squander like this with such important, political, rich countries all putting their fingers in, but not sorting out a basic humanity on, on the ground level, like providing water, like getting food in. There has been a blockade of the whole of north of Yemen by uh, an internationally recognized government which is recognized and supported by Saudi Arabia, Britain, America and UAE, which has seriously limited the access to not just food, but also aid to large sections of the community. 80% of the population is in the north. Likewise, the Houthis, backed by being given weapons, being given training, being given influence, support and intelligence, operational equipment by Iran, have managed to exert and create misery for a lot of people in the south. Well, how does that make you feel then? Ahmed, you look at your country and it looks to me if we had not had the best part of 10 years of civil war, that this would be a place that the world would wish to visit. 
100%, 100% Nail. Yemen is one of the most beautiful countries in the world, you know, when it comes to culture, with the traditions that we have, we have a variety. If you go, if you, you know, if you travel all around the country, you would be very surprised how you would see a diff uh, different cultures. Like if, if you go from a village to, to a village, you will f see a difference in their clothes, in their food, and the, the variety is so interesting. I really feel very absent, uh, very sad about what I'm seeing. I know my country, I used to be a tourist guide before I became a journalist. And I saw, I would say, hundreds of people. I never ever met a, a tourist who came to Yemen and never come back again or send their family or friends. I really love my country and I, I, I came from this land, the land of, you know, of Queen Sheba, as we say. You know, Yemen was one of the oldest civilizations that was led by a woman, by a queen of Sheba. I feel there is hope. I feel that with, with the power of youth and the power of, uh, uh, of all Yemenis, we can rebuild our country again and we can, we can do a very big change in, in this country. It's just we need to, to get rid of this war. We have to build the trust between the political parties and give access. As I always say, I always, talk, I always meet diplomats, ambassadors I mean, who are responsible for Yemen. You have to engage youth in the peace process. You have to engage women. You have to engage, you know, different, you know, I mean, the lawyers, doctors, everyone, because peace cannot come with politicians only. If the, politician, if the politicians could done peace, they could have done it nine years ago. We should find a way how to make this uh, war, uh, how this war should end soon. Alex, Ahmed, good to talk to you both. Thanks very much. Every weekend around the world, millions of people take to the streets to protest Israel's actions in Gaza. They carry placards, sing songs, demand loudly that their politicians take action to end the bloodshed, to avert the humanitarian consequences of unchecked violence. All this for a place most have never and will never visit. So, ordinary Yemenis are asking, why not the same support for us? And how much longer will the violence continue, both in Yemen and Gaza? And if you want to watch the reporting by Alex Crawford and her team in Yemen, simply head to the website, skynews.com, or check out the Sky News YouTube channel. That's your lot for this edition of The Daily. We'll see you again next time.